Welcome to today's Q&A session. We hope you are following our NDS Success Program and you had a chance to watch our last webinar. Our last webinar was on service design. Before we start, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia. We respect their continuing connection to land, waters and community, and we pay our respect to their cultures, to their elders, past, present and emerging. My name is Dr. Ellen Schuler, and today I'm here with my colleague, Andrew Ellis. Hi, Andrew. Hi. And we're both business consultants with, with CBB, and we are working with NES providers on a daily basis, and today we will be answering your questions. Setting up a new service or growing as a service under the NES um, is not an easy task, and it requires a lot of learning. And the NDS is a fast changing environment. Some people say the NDS is, is the plane is built while it's flying. In July, a new price guide was published, and now it's August, and we already have version, I think it's seven. So, you, as an NDS provider, you always have to stay up to date. And we at CBB, we are trying to stay up to date, and so we are doing, we try to do our best today to answer all your questions. But of course, we are not the NDIS, and if you have any doubts or further detailed questions, or if you need legal advice, please um, ring the NDIA or speak to your lawyer. So, um, I might ask a first question. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. This is a question we often, we very often get asked. Um, I am providing services as an unregistered, unregistered provider. But I have been approached by a participant who has has got agency managed funding. Can I deliver this service, and how can I deliver this service? Well, there's a, there's a few different ways that we can um, go about this. So, if the participant has just received their NDIS plan, um, they could call the NDIS and ask for a light touch review, and then they could change their financial management to plan management. So that would allow them to be able to access your services and obviously then they'd need to go through the process of briefing and working with their new plan manager. Alternatively, you might be able to find a, a registered provider or an agency who's willing to let you work as a subcontractor. Um, they would then claim the funds from the NDIS portal and pay you after you've delivered the service, but you might need to be prepared for the fact that they would want to take a bit of a cut to cover some of their administrative expenses that way. Subcontracting arrangements are possible and common. However, the contracting organisation also needs to ensure that the subcontractor has the necessary disability worker clearance and training and delivers the service in line with their expectations. So I think there's a lot more discussion that we'll have around this topic in next week's webinar yes. where we're in the quality and safeguarding and so there'll be a lot more information on registered and unregistered providers yeah. that, we, that we go through there. Correct. We'll talk about this next week. Um, so here's a question for you, Ellen. Okay. We've, Shoot. We've heard uh, rumours that core and capacity building supports can be spent flexibly soon. Is this true and do we have any idea when that's likely to happen? Oh yes, that is a very good question. Is So the question is, is core and capacity funding flexible? Uh, this has actually been announced last year by the Minister uh, for the NDS, Stuart Roberts. Uh, he announced, I think in November it was, that the funding will be flexible and everyone has been eagerly waiting for this. And I actually think the NDS has put it on hold because of the COVID-19, yeah. because they had to, uh, to deal with the emergency response. There has been a review of the NDIS Act, the June review, and that June review has made a lot of recommendations for improvements. will be implemented and the changes will go ahead. However, I think it will um, take another six months um, for this yeah. to, to really be fully implemented. So, uh, yes, it will be flexible soonish, <laughs> but at the very moment it is not uh, flexible yet. Okay. Um, and trying to predict when and how and what have you that was going to happen this would be Look, near impossible. So I think we it have, is it is it is stated. absolutely impossible. Um, you know, I think there is a lot going on behind the scenes because the way providers charge is is linked to registration groups, and the and the way the NDIS system the portal is actually set up. 
So they would need to make a lot of changes to the that right. portal and to registration groups. And I, you know, I don't know how this is going to happen. It takes time. It takes it absolutely um, okay. takes time. We might jump to our next question. So we've got a few specific questions for different types of organisations that come out through this Q and A session. So here's one about. Uh, someone wanting to, to start an arts and crafts program. So we'd like to start an art and crafts program, but we're unsure if we should offer this under core or capacity building supports. Do you have any advice? That is a good question. So group supports under core are generally not very well paid. Mm -hmm. However, most of our participants actually have core funding. So it is actually much easier to find clients for your program, unless there are already lots of arts and crafts programs in, in your area. Uh, capacity supports are higher paid. Um, however, it is can be a bit more challenging to find the right clients because as at the very moment, it is uh, the funding is not flexible. So participants or clients would need to have the funding in the correct uh, funding um, category. Unless you are actually a therapist, um, for therapists it's, it is possible. So for an arts and crafts program, you would need to be, you know, an art therapist, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, clients would would have to have funding under improved daily living skills, and um, then it would be a bit easier to set up group supports. However, please remember, if you're setting up a capacity building program, um, you always need to work towards the goals um, of your participants. You need to demonstrate who, how you are working towards the goals, and you might actually be required to write reports. So, you know, if you're just just doing a bit of arts and crafts activities with your clients, then that's certainly would certainly be a core mm -hmm. um, activity. Also, because group supports aren't very well paid, we always recommend that you actually do a little bit of a costing yep. first before you set up um, your program. We will do a um, session on costing. The last webinar is about costing. That's right. Um, if you're running the group support in a centre, then you can actually charge per participant for um, for the centre cost. So you can uh, pay the, it's called the centre capital cost, and it is at the moment $2.15 per participant. So if you're supporting 10 participants in an hour, then you can charge $21.50 for the hour. If you support these 10 participants for two hours, then you can charge $40, $43. Um, it's, it is not a lot of money if you have to pay rent for the facility. So please consider those costs if you set up a group, group program. All right, I've got one more question for you, Ellen, here about um, support coordination. So, um, if we are wanting to set up to offer support coordination, do we need to register with the NDIS Commission and what qualifications do we need um, or experience do we need even to be able to do support okay, coordination? Yeah. Um, yes, you can offer support coordination as an unregistered provider, that is possible. However, you will only be able to provide services to plan and to self-manage participants. That will limit your customer base and you should consider that it's mostly um, vulnerable people who get funded for mm -hmm. support coordination and right. they might actually have um, plan managed funds. If you are planning to register for support coordination, that is support co uh, support, um, the category 106, which is called assistance in coordinating and managing life stages. It's actually not called support coordination, so a lot of providers, mm -hmm. a lot of providers actually miss that little piece of detail. Um, it is the certification audit. We will talk about the different audits next time, so it is a bit more involved. There are no um, uh, professional qualifications required. However, the the, the commission has published requirements for the verification audit. And there are, for instance, um, um, requirements for so, um, support workers or for social workers, and they need to have experience with delivering person-centered services and working with people with disabilities. And we would expect this as a minimum experience for a support coordinator. 
So port colonnades are really important in, in the mm -hmm. life of NES Absolutely. participants. So it is really important that they have some experience with disabilities either because they have a family member or they have already some professional experience as a support uh, worker. Um, there is no official training provided by the NDIA, but there are actually established support coordination businesses who are offering really good training courses. For instance, at the Growing Space in Adelaide, they are uh, offering a three-day online course for support coordinators and we we strongly recommend that any support coordinator who wants to deliver services actually is undergoing some good training. Also, if you're if you're running an, uh, a larger organisation and you have several support coordinators, you might want to set up specialist areas mm. so that some support coordinators are more specialised in certain areas and others are more uh, specialised in other, uh, for instance, type of disabilities. And it's also very important that they really share their learnings and um, and share their knowledge. So you want to look at how you want to establish that in your organisation. Also, um, I mentioned the tune review before. So the NDS is actually currently reviewing the rules for funding for support coordination. So there will be some changes in regards yeah. to support coordination. And also they are looking into this whole conflict of interest thing because support coordination is not supposed to, to be that you are referring more participants to your own services. Support coordination is actually to give participants the best possible service. So as a support coordinator, you really have to demonstrate that you give uh, choice and control to, to, uh, to your clients. And, you know, there might be rules around that uh, support coordinators have to be independent. At the moment, this rule doesn't exist, but, you know, we will see what the, the future will bring us. Yeah. And I think if it does change, there's going to be quite a shift really isn't there because there's a lot of organisations where they're providing, shift, uh, providing support coordination and other services too. I've, I've heard that it's about 50% of support coordinators at the moment who are actually providing um, other supports other at, supports, the, yeah. at the moment yeah, as well. Yeah. Right, I have another question for you. <laughs> yes, so um, we would like to offer advocacy services. Um, what line item is that in the, in the support catalogue? Uh, and... Um, what can we charge? Well, unfortunately, you can't charge anything for advocacy work. Um, the NDIS does not fund advocacy, and we need to find some other funding sources for that. So um, many different organisations that are operating in the NDIS are, are charitable organisations anyway, and so have um, the ability to raise funds through fundraising, through grants, through philanthropy, um, and other um, programs, NDIS Community Connector Program, uh, which is block funded. Things like that um, do create other pathways, but in terms of the normal um, charging um, that the NDIS other services are, you can't charge for advocacy in that way. Um, support coordinators aren't supposed to be advocates, um, but really the role of a support coordinator um, does involve educating participants about their plan uh, and their funding, and hence, um, as you assist your clients and their family members uh, or carers to learn, um, you help them to um, through that process to be better self-advocates. Um, as a support coordination, you can also attend the planning meeting and charge for that time uh, after there's that initial NDIS plan is in place, but and not but not before that plan is in place. Yeah. Okay. All right, I have another question for you, Andrew. Um, we are working through a range of different ideas for NDIS services. How can we actually evaluate which one of our ideas is the best idea? What, with what idea should we start? I think this is a terrific question and it's one that I've got a bit at the moment. I've got a couple of clients that I'm working with um, where we're going through, you know, 10 or 20 different ways that they could potentially grow their services. It might be to grow from one geographic region into another. It might be to bring on new types of services. It might be that they've got a certain skill set like social work uh, within their organisation that they're delivering services under different funding mechanisms and they're looking to move into the NDIS and use some of those existing people and skill sets that they've got. So I think um, this is a common challenge for many organisations that you might have many different ways that you could grow. And so the question is, how do you take all those ideas? And if you try to do a bit of everything, you're probably not going to get anywhere. And it's important to focus on 
two, three, four, um, depending on how big the organization is, how much you can take on of that. So I think part of the answer also depends on the appetite for growth and appetite for risk within the organization. Uh, I know some organizations have got um, dedicated resources and are keen to be growing as fast as they reasonably can, whereas others, um, you know, it's an incremental approach and they want to um, just sort of um, slowly, slowly grow and then use the surpluses that are um, gained through that growth to reinvest and and to do it um, more organically. Um, I think from our earlier webinars, if you go back and have a look at the understanding the market, um, you, you know, processes like we've been through uh, in this series of webinars will help you look at your strengths, your assets as an organization, um, understanding the market and the needs in your area. Um, also seeing how the services fit within NDOs registration groups, because that'll generate, how, dictate how much revenue that you can have. Um, and I think probably just the last comment I'd make is it's worth if you've got all these different ideas for how you could grow, coming up with some criteria of maybe a couple of different points about, you know, how do you make that decision? What's most important? Um, and some ideas for that, it might be, you know, are you trying to have the, um, the growth area that can have the biggest impact? Is it the biggest growth potential? Is it about building from your existing locations where you're providing services? Is it about it using existing resources rather than hiring new ones? Is it about having easier growth rather than, you know, riskier growth? Um, all those things are ideas around what might be the criteria. So I think if you if you figure out which of those couple of things are most important and then compare your all your options for growth against them, that will help you to be able to prioritise what the um, what the right order is for you for being able to grow. Yeah. Uh, question for you again, Ellen. Okay. Um, we're providing services and have a long waiting list of potential clients. We'd like to grow our services, but are struggling to recruit workers for our current program. Have you got some ideas on, I guess, recruiting workers um, and how you can improve recruitment like that? Yeah, finding, finding the right staff can be very challenging, especially in rural areas. We often see job ads which uh, state that they are looking for a support worker with a cert three in individual support and X amount of years of experience in working as a disability support worker. And it is, I think it is, can be impossible to find enough people with yeah. that qualification and with this experience. And my advice is to look for people with the right attitude yeah. and the right values and the right fit for your organization. And then consider what training can we actually provide um, in the job um, and also you know if you know if you're if you want the person to have more in-depth training you might want to subsidize a course in the future mm. um, in small communities it might be actually worthwhile asking around you know ask ask community groups if they know someone think think outside the square you know maybe there is a retired or semi-retired teacher who could help mm. out or maybe there's a local osh where where staff is actually not only working early mornings and late afternoons, but actually yeah. have time during the day, so maybe they could fill in some some shifts. Maybe there are some local TAFE students or some some uni students. Um, I have a friend who's actually hired someone from the Wool Woolworth checkout. Oh, wow. um, they've been chatting, on, you know, on a weekly basis while doing their shopping, and she thought, "Wow, this guy has a really good attitude um, and work ethic," and she actually hired him as a support worker <laughs> um, maybe there are also people with disabilities in your in your area who could actually be a great support to other people with disabilities mm. and as i said um you know qualification is not everything i think life experience is extremely yeah. extremely important and make sure whoever you hire that they actually understand the role and understand also the working hours involved yeah yep great answer and and I think you, you said early on there about recruiting for attitude and values, and I couldn't agree with you more on that. I think, yes, it's hard to get the right skilled people, but if you hire on the values that you have in your organization and get that fit right, you can train for um, any of the other skills that people are going to need. Um, so I have a question now about transport for uh, to answer. Um, so someone said, there's hardly any transport options in our area and no activities for people with disabilities. Should we purchase a bus and offer programs? 
Good question. Um, I think it's actually really good that the, this provider has identified a gap in the market. Mm. So I think it is, sounds like a really good idea to offer some community programs. Um, but I would make sure that you can actually offer this service widely. First question to ask is, are there actually enough people in the area to offer this service to? Is it just 10 people with disabilities? Or are, are there actually 100 people? And how many of those people would actually like to access your services? And what sort of activities would they actually like to do? So what could you actually offer? Also, purchasing a bus can be extremely expensive mm -hmm. or, you know, the ongoing leasing fees are expensive and how often do you really need to use it? So maybe think about if there is someone in your area, you know, a local church or the community centre, do they already have a bus? And is there a way of sharing that bus so you, you yeah. don't have additional costs by, by setting, setting up this service? Also, map out what else do you need uh, setting up these services. So, what what are your staffing re uh, requirements? How will you promote the service? Is that is there any cost involved, or can you do it for free somehow? You know, word of mouth, or you know, notice boards, or you know, local paper, or whatever. Um, yes, and and are there any additional resources you need? So, so please do before you start any services. If you if it's small or big, do a bit of a costing analysis and and consider is it worthwhile doing and is it worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And if you know if the income generated is not big enough, are there any other funding sources? You know, is there any? Could you fund it with some donations, uh, or could could the community centre subsidise it somehow? Maybe yeah. giving you the bus for free. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like this this question, we've had lots of questions coming into our consultant team over the last what, month or six weeks of people who are identifying gaps or needs or um, you know, wanting to start an NDIS service or, you know, heard about the NDIS and wanting to get involved. And I think, um, you know, I, I, would, I would add to what you said here by just saying that the, this whole webinar series, I think, is really geared quite, um, you know, strongly and positively for people who are, um, in this sort of a place and you know for, for people who spend the time going through each of these webinars um, listening to them following along the slides do their own exercises as you go as, as is prompted there in the business plan templates and other things like that I think the yeah, organizations that go through all of that are going to find themselves really well equipped by the end of this program to think about you know what they not just is there a gap and should we do something but having an idea about how much it's going to cost how much they might make from it, how many people they can serve, how do they market it, um, all the compliance, yep. quality safeguarding they need to do as well. So yeah, I think that's that's a that kind of a question is quite typical to what we're hearing yep. uh, from many people at the moment. Uh, so one more question for you, Ellen. Can I can I be our client's plan manager and pay for our invoices, our own invoices? Do plan managers um, get a commission? So tell us maybe a bit more about plan management. Yeah. So. As a plan manager, you need to be a registered provider and you need to be registered for that service. And as part of this registration, you actually need to demonstrate that you are managing conflict of interest. Well, so if you want to pay your own invoices, there is a clear conflict of interest. So please be aware of this and you would have to have a clear and strict separation of, you know, your service provision and, um, and the the plan management. Also, you know, participants are free to choose whatever plan manager they want. And I think for a participant, it would actually be not be very smart to choose the same plan manager um, who's also providing your services. But because, you know, what if you want to change your services and you're no longer happy with your services, yeah. you know, then, you know, the, the plan manager might make some trouble here and, and, and not release the funds. So, you know, personally, I think as a provider, you know, either do plan management or um, or provide services or develop really strict um, guidelines in how you're going to manage conflict mm -hmm. of interest. Yeah, that's great. And, yes, the funding is actually funded in the NDS plan under improved life choices. So you do not have to, you know, um, this is extra funding in the NDIS plan, so the provider does not have to pay for the plan manager. Right. That's good. Okay. 
So a question for you, Andrew, and that is about sole traders. Um, as a sole trader, I feel that many of the aspects of the NDIS are designed for large businesses and corporations. It feels overwhelming for a small business. Is it actually worthwhile to offer NDIS services as a sole trader? I think it's a, this is a really loaded question, <laughs> a really big <laughs> challenge for many people, but um, there's a huge percentage of um, providers under the NDIS at the moment who are sole traders. So I know they're doing if, well. If, if that's right, if, um, if, if this is you asking this question, then you're not the only person who's probably thought this. Um, and I think the other thing I would add is um, a bit like I've, I've shared already today going through this webinar series, um, I said to someone the other day, it's, the NDIS is a bit like studying for your year 12 maths exam or whatever it is. If if you take the shortcuts and, you know, try to skimp on the study, then, um, you know, you won't do as well as if you put the time and the effort in. And I don't think there's any, um, uh, I think it's really important to put that work in. And I think that you'll see the payoff for it. Um, you know, Ellen, when I hear you talk about um, different uh, codes that people can charge under within the price guide, that's certainly evident to me that the time you spend understanding that will help organisations or help the time organisations spend doing that will help them to know what more that they can charge. And if they know all the things they can charge for rather than just one thing you think is okay, then you're going to be revenue-wise in a better place and uh, being able to deliver better services as well. So. It's, it's true there's a lot of work involved with being a registered provider um, and uh, many large businesses have got sort of dedicated teams working on invoicing or policy and procedure and all those sorts of things. But um, there are many different providers who are out there who are sole traders working in the NDIS and, and doing quite well. Um, if you're delivering th um, therapies or cleaning services, those are considered low risk services. Um, and you can provide them just to plan or self-manage participants without registration. So there are certain types of services you can do that way. If you want to register with the NDIS, then you need to take the verification pathway and that's relatively easy. Um, you need to be able to just demonstrate area uh, compliance in four areas. So that's HR, risk management, um, complaints and incident management. I'm going to talk through a lot more of this in the, the next webinar on quality and safeguarding uh, and doing this kind of verification audit um, is not as expensive as a certification audit. Um, they'll only need one audit every three years um, and probably only a couple of thousand dollars, but it, every organisation is going to be a little bit different on that. Software systems can make your life easier as well. Um, some sole traders might only have a small number of clients and so a manual system or a low cost app to be able to process um, that shouldn't be too onerous if there's only a small number of clients. Um, but as you um, get scale and you know, literally hundreds of clients and hundreds of invoices and hundreds of service agreements that if you're managing, then you certainly want some software that's going to assist with, with that. Um, there's a lot of information in this NDA success webinar series that can be applied to sole traders just as much as larger organisations. And I think it's just important to go through the thought process. And we might talk about marketing in a few webinars time, for instance, and to a large organisation, you might write a 20 page marketing plan, but for a sole trader, just having that, you know, half hour of thought process of how do I market my services and writing, you know, three or five bullet points of what you're going to do can be, you know, just as useful and is, is equally as relevant. Um, yeah, I think, I think that probably gets us through that. There's, yeah, so there's, we, we'll be talking about the verification and certification, certification in, audits. in the next, next webinar week. so that it will go live on Tuesday. Yep. Yeah in another week's time. So yeah, yeah. And, and we will also no explain, than. you know, which registration groups actually will need verification and which will need certification. Terrific. Yeah. So that pretty well brings us to the end of our questions for today. So we appreciate you tuning in for, uh, to watch the webinar, also tuning in to watch this Q&A session. Um, please um, reach out and uh, ask us any questions you've got uh, via email um, to ndis at cbb.com.au or um, you can post onto our Facebook group or into the CBB LinkedIn page as well. So Facebook. 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 Thank you for watching uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. See ya.